let's talk about 3D printer fires. How did they used to happen and is this even possible anymore? Today, we're gonna get some flames going and see how effective this blaze cut system is at putting them out automatically. A 3D printer fire is something you might not think about until it's far too late, but how likely is it? Today, we test this blaze cut auto suppression system. For the purposes of testing, it's been sent to me free of charge, and I will test in accordance with my review policy, and that means seeing if it does work as advertised and assessing if there's even any need for it. Unfortunately, five to 10 years ago, in an earlier stage of home 3D printing, fires were still rare, but they weren't entirely uncommon. For a while, there seemed to be thread after thread showing devastating images of best case scenario, just the printer damaged, or worst case, the fire spreading and destroying the room or even the building. A common culprit was the ANET A8 as seen in this article. These were known to have a series of shortcuts and defects that unless the user addressed with a series of mods and upgrades was the equivalent to a ticking time bomb. But even with all of this, this particular printer still caught fire and the clue can be seen from the heater cartridge for the hot end being separated. Several years ago, I made a video with an incredibly natural thumbnail talking about 3D printer fires and covering this exact scenario. And it explained that the wiring for a 3D printer hot end was pretty simple when working, but damage to the wiring from either a short or break could create a dangerous situation. As I showed in that video, 3D printer firmware should have safety measures in place to detect these faults and shut everything down. And I say should because back then, 3D printer manufacturers were often irresponsible and would disable these safety features in the firmware. The worst scenario being a thermal runaway where either the heater cartridge or the thermistor separates from the hot end, meaning the hot end is not reading the correct temperature and the firmware keeps on supplying power to the heater cartridge, causing it to overheat dramatically and potentially ignite the 3D printer or the printed part. And that appears to be the cause of the fire in the article we were looking at previously. But here's the thing, thermal runaway and other safety protections these days should be in place for every 3D printer and firmware. So are 3D printer fires still possible? The answer is a resounding yes. Any electrical device, especially one with heaters, has this risk. Think of a toaster, an oven, a hairdryer. If they go wrong, it can be catastrophic. The truth is that modern 3D printers are safer, but they're not foolproof because no electrical device is. To test this, I went searching for recent fires, and I found this Instagram post from seven weeks ago, labeled, Reports Emerge of Fires Caused by Chidi Plus 4 3D Printer 3D Printing. The reality is that there's no source here, so this image might be matching the description, or it could be completely made up to try and slander the company. But I did find this thread on Reddit, where a user posted up their fire firsthand. Looking at the image, it was only a minor one, and it looks like there was no strain relief for this bed wiring, meaning it could flex back and forth until it work hardened and failed. It's just a reminder that everything works perfectly until it doesn't. Another reminder of this idea was the Bamboo Lab A1. For me, it tested great out of the box, but there was a problem lurking within. A fault from factory of the bed heater wiring resulting in a factory recall. And although small, there was a chance this could potentially result in a fire. The chances may be small, but it still makes sense to have an insurance measure in place, so let's test one. What we're testing today is an automatic fire suppression system from BlazeCut, and they are a company based in Australia, manufacturing in Slovakia, and with offices elsewhere in the world. Specifically, the product that we're testing is the T-Series, which is completely passive and automated. It can be installed in any enclosed space where there could be a fire, such as a vehicle or an electrical box. It only needs to be clamped securely in place somewhere near the top, and assuming the built-in indicator is in the green, it's armed and ready to go without you doing anything else. Like we've discussed, if there is a fire, the temperature will naturally rise as the flames spread. The outside of the T-Series will automatically rupture when a preset temperature is reached. That means without any human intervention or even knowledge of the fire, once that temperature is reached, the gas will escape, coat the fire, putting it out, without damaging any of the electronics. Personally, I think that's a good selling point because we don't want to destroy our 3D printer if the system triggers from a false alarm. So this is definitely something we'll be testing in this video. Now, interestingly enough, a year ago, Prusa released a range of new enclosures. 
and buried in that blog post was the information that you could include an optional fire suppression system. And if we find that product on the Prusa store, we can see that we have a T025, which as you might've guessed means it's 250 millimeters long. And lower down on the page, we have confirmation that this is a blaze cut unit. As we can see on the website, there's quite a range of different systems. And if we come to the application guide, we can click through to determine what size we need. For any engine compartment or enclosure, all we need is the width, length, and height. This is something that should be very easy to measure, whether you're doing it for a 3D printer with a built-in enclosure, an enclosure add-on that you're putting around a normal 3D printer, or any other machine like a laser cutter. Whatever it is, it does need to be enclosed to function correctly. You might even consider installing one of these inside a PC enclosure to combat fiery issues with GPUs. Entering our dimensions in meters into the selection calculator will tell us the volume of the space plus the recommended product that has enough suppressant to fill that space. One thing missing from the website are any prices or purchasing options. And that's because Blaze Cut don't sell directly to the public. You can either contact them or just get Googling to find a retailer that's near you. And to give you an idea of price, the model that you're going to see tested retails for 230 Australian, which is around 150 US dollars. Let's unbox and then try two applications. In terms of packaging, there's not that much to it because it's such a simple product. Longer units will come in a bigger box and the shorter units will instead come in a skinny box. Inside the box, you'll find the actual T-Series unit which has a liquid through the translucent cover and you can see bubbles sloshing back and forth. And the other thing you'll find is an instruction manual as well as stickers and cable ties for installation. The manual, as you might expect for a product related to fire, has a lot of warnings about the correct type of installation. But as you'll see, that job is still pretty straightforward. There's also further instructions for optional accessories which we'll discuss later. Let's start by installing a T2000 2 meter version which is destined for my race car. Now this car already has a built-in fire suppression system. The rules mandate it and here's how it works. Spread around the engine bay are three nozzles connected to that tank. There's one pointing back towards the engine and fuel system and then one on either side of the engine bay pointing towards the center. Furthermore, there's two more nozzles facing the driver in the cockpit. The system is manually armed and then activated with the big red button. That should save me and the car in the event of a fire or accident, but what if I'm knocked unconscious? Because of this, I'm very glad to install a second automated system. This version of the T-Series line, as well as the installation location, was recommended after looking at my car in consultation with BlazeCut. There's not much you can really get wrong here. You have to respect the minimum bending radius of 16 centimeters, and you don't want to place it too close to an exhaust or other really hot area so it doesn't prematurely go off. Beyond that, it's just a matter of using the supplied cable ties to hold it in place, ensuring I'll still be able to see the inspection gauge and putting some sort of protection anywhere where the tube has a chance of fouling and rubbing through. I could then reinstall the bodywork over the top and use a light to conduct a visual inspection to make sure nothing was fouling. I was pleased to find that everything was able to fit back on properly, so I could remove the bodywork for the last time, tighten up the cable ties and then cut off the tails. Job done. Personally, I'm very happy to have additional fire protection that doesn't require me to set it off and won't damage any electronics if I've installed it wrong and it goes off when it shouldn't. So how about our installation with 3D printing? One of the units sent to me was specifically done so so I could do a real world test and see how well the system worked. BlazeCut have their own video on YouTube with a half meter T-series set up diagonally inside an IKEA LAC enclosure. The flames we see here are instantly very tall and very hot and in around 16 seconds, the unit triggers, releases its gas, and puts out all of the flames. In this situation, it's diligent of BlazeCut to send out a safety document advising me on how to run the test. But the one they sent wasn't really applicable to a real-world 3D printing situation, because as a source of the flame, it uses rags soaked in fuel ignited by an external spark. So as we saw in that YouTube video, the flames will be very big, very quickly, triggering the system quite fast but I wanted to do a test closer to what we might realistically expect from an actual 3D printer fire. Let's remind ourselves of the three things we need to start a fire. Oxygen, heat, and fuel. Oxygen is going to be present pretty much no matter what, so let's concentrate on the other two. Firstly, the fuel. And in case you didn't know, pretty much all of the 3D printer filaments we use are flammable. And this includes PLA, which you're seeing here. Once ignited, it pretty much burns like a candle wick, although a little bit faster and not super hot. 
In the past, 3D printer frames were often plastic or even plywood, providing even more fuel, but even without this, the filament from the part we're printing, and especially the spool of filament nearby, will be a suitable source for fuel. 3D printer inside an enclosure will be already hot, but we'd still need an ignition source. Here I'm testing a 40 watt heater cartridge with 24 volts going directly into it. That's enough to make it glow red hot, but it wasn't enough to actually ignite the PLA. All it would do is instantly melt and leave a big mess over the cartridge. I think a more likely source is a wiring fault, and here we can see what happens when too much current goes through the black and green wires. If they get hot enough, they'll burn right through the insulation as it melts away. To simulate this repeatedly and therefore more safely, I'm going to use nichrome resistance wire. As covered in this video of how 3D printing used to be 10 years ago, we used to make custom hot ends, wrapping this around a barrel and then insulating it, including a thermistor, for modern off-the-shelf hot ends were readily available. If I put 24 volts through this, I should be able to simulate a wire that is catching on fire. However, if you have too little wire, it glows fast but degrades and destroys itself pretty much instantly. But after some experimentation and failures, I was able to find the right amount that will glow without destroying itself and still be hot enough to ignite some filament on fire. With that sorted, I could set up the rest of the test and I'm using a wham bam pop up enclosure and inside an old Elegoo Ender 3 clone. Since this is a very temporary install, I've just used tape to hold the T-Series to the roof. For my quick test, this is fine, but this is definitely not how you would install it if you were doing so permanently. Instead, you'd want a rigid bracket system like Prusa uses. After moving everything to the garage to increase safety, here's the rest of my setup. I'm on a concrete floor with nothing combustible, and I've got a little Arduino unit that I'm going to sit in the corner if the gas doesn't damage electronics. Both this and the 3D printer should still function as normal afterwards. I've turned on the heated bed to 100 degrees to simulate printing something like ABS, and I've got a thermocouple poking through the top of the enclosure to measure the temperature within, and I'm using a hairdryer to get the internal temperature of the chamber up to 50 degrees, as that's realistic based on my previous testing. After the inside surpassed 50 degrees, I continued with the test. I powered it up the nichrome heating element and brought down some PLA to try and ignite it naturally. But of course, I couldn't replicate my testing when it counted and struggled to get the PLA to ignite. So instead, I introduced a blowtorch to set the filament and its spool on fire, quickly closing and sealing the front of the enclosure. Nowhere near as spectacular as the test from Blaze Cut on the YouTube channel, but a lot more realistic for what you might expect on an actual 3D printer. The fire did steadily increase in magnitude, but the peak of its power only got the enclosure up to a maximum of around 69 degrees. Soon after this, the bit that was on fire melted to the bottom and fizzled out with the temperature steadily going down again. And wouldn't you know it, a few minutes later, the fire self-extinguished as it ran out of fuel. Now in real life, this would have been an ideal outcome, but obviously I wanted to test this unit properly. I removed the roll of PLA, which was looking pretty worse for wear, and instead installed a big roll of ABS. And that's because when trying to burn the PLA, it was clear that the ABS spool was even more flammable, so why not just use ABS filament overall? With the enclosure back on and a hairdryer assisted 55 degrees internal, I opened the front and used a bigger torch to briefly ignite the whole roll of filament. This briefly spiked the internal temperature to over 120, but that alone wasn't enough to set off the T-Series. You might think this ignition source is unrealistic, but imagine the heater cartridge falls out or there's a glowing red wire that falls into a print where quite a lot of plastic has already been deposited. I think what we're seeing here should be fairly close to that. Even with this much flame steadily growing, it took around 100 seconds for the fire suppression system to activate. By this stage, a lot of smoke had engulfed the garage, not enough that I had to leave, but enough to make it pretty stinky. Watching the internal temperature, as measured by the thermocouple connected to the multimeter, we can see that it quickly went past 110, and as it was heading towards 120 degrees, there was a very loud boom, the T-Series burst, and the flames were completely put out. We can also see that the enclosure temperature lost about 30 degrees within the first few seconds, and continued to nosedive after that. So let's inspect the aftermath to see how well the system worked. The 3D printer was still running, with seemingly no damage to the electronics, and my little Arduino module was still functioning exactly like it did before. Furthermore, there was no residue, so that's a definite tick for the claim that electronics won't be damaged by the gas. Removing the enclosure, we can see the extent of the damage within, and the T-Series has fallen off the roof from the shock, 
I don't think this would happen if it was installed more securely. Remember that this is a one-time use product, and we can see why here, with a giant rupture where the gas escaped and put out the flames. So yes, this would now be going in the bin, but hopefully it would have done its job and stopped a much larger catastrophe. Now surprisingly to me, for all of that flame, the actual spool of ABS wasn't really that burnt. Sure, one side is black and charred, but most of the filament is still there. I would have expected it to melt or be engulfed in flames more quickly. Inspecting the actual 3D printer, it did seem to be 100% functional. So I'm glad that I didn't destroy with this test a perfectly working machine. However, I should point out that if in real life your 3D printer started a fire, you certainly wouldn't go back to using it immediately until you determined exactly what went wrong and had addressed it. The only damage to the printer was that from the smoke of the flames, and most of this did come off using a wet wipe. In fact, with a quick once over, you couldn't tell that the printer had been engulfed in flames by a visual inspection. The old bed was covered in molten plastic, so with the new one, this printer is back to 100% working order. So the main reminders of the test are the soot on the floor in my garage, and the smoke and soot on the inside of the Wham Bam enclosure, but you'd have to say that this survived quite well, and with enough cleaning should come back to as new condition. So, quite effective, right? Well, there was still one thing that was bothering me. The T-Series system 100% worked in extinguishing the flames, but as we can see, both the 3D printer and my shorted wire simulation are still very active. So doesn't that just mean that given enough time, things will heat up again and perhaps have reignition? We also have to remember that if a MOSFET that switches a hot end or bed fails, it might fail in the on state, which means the main board and firmware can't shut down the power going to those heaters no matter how hard it tries. So being able to cut the overall power to the machine is important. In my studio, directly above my printers, I have a network connected smoke detector. This will alert my phone and then I can use the smart plug to kill the power to all of my machines. Now that could be used in addition to a T-Series but this would be manual intervention and not automatic like the rest of the system. But what I think would be a better fit is an optional accessory. We can see on the website they talk about a pressure switch system, and if there's a drop in pressure from the T-Series going off, it can send an electrical signal to alarms, buzzers, or anything else to trigger a shutdown. Now interestingly enough, this seems like an obvious match for 3D printing, but it's not really promoted on their website. There are some wiring instructions in the printed manual and it does seem feasible to set up the switch so a Raspberry Pi receives the signal and shuts off a smart plug. This is an option well worth considering if you're shopping for one of these systems. After testing, I feel a system like this does have a lot of merit as insurance for some sort of electrical fault. In any case, I hope you are taking sensible measures to make your 3D printing as safe as possible. Like having a smoke alarm directly above, having firefighting tools nearby, and if you are using an enclosure, storing the filament external to it. Thanks very much to my patrons for assisting me in designing all of these tests, and thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy safe 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.